Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. My name is Skip Rutherford, and I'm dean of the Clinton School. This is uh, the last week of uh, activity at the Clinton School. Graduation is this weekend, so it's a busy time for us and our students, and they are, um, many of them, um, completing their final papers and other activities. So uh, could I ask if you'd please turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off? Philip Howard is our speaker today, and I've been enjoying a visit with him. Lawyer, author, civic leader, political and corporate advisor, well-known advocate of government and legal reform, going to talk about, I think, public service reform, and we had discussion about higher education reform. Uh, the author of The Rule of Nobody, which uh, uh, he will be signing after his presentation. It makes the claim that government is broken and then offers some thoughts of what we can do about it, which is interesting. He is the founder of Common Good, a national uh, coalition dedicated to restoring common sense in America. Graduate of Yale and the University of Virginia Law School, partner in the Covington and Burlington Law Firm in New York. Please welcome Mr. Philip Howard to the Clinton School. Uh, th thank you, Dean Rutherford, and thank you all for coming out. I, uh, coming here um, unleashes a lot of memories for me. I worked very closely with President Clinton and Vice President Gore on the Reinventing Government program uh, 20 years ago now, or almost 20 years ago, and taking a tour of that magnificent presidential library <coughs> brought back a flood of memories of, of uh, how much was going on in that period and uh, made me a little nostalgic uh, in terms of how little is going on now, so, which, is, which is what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> I think that we're, uh, we're in a troubling and historic place in the history of our democracy, and uh, the reason is that our leaders seem unable to make obvious choices. It's different even than 20 years ago when President Clinton was enacting uh, historic welfare reform to make that work better and to get people off the, off the, um, of their dependencies there and so many other reforms, uh, balancing the budget, uh, extraordinary time of, of productivity in our country. And we don't seem to be able to do the most obvious choices today. We can't, Congress can barely raise the national debt ceiling to avoid default on our debt, much less make any of the choices that are needed to, to bring our budgets into alignment or to address needed priorities. So in, in, in setting out to write this book a few years ago, <clears throat> I had an insight, I thought it was a brilliant insight, uh, it's shared by 98% of Americans. Uh, <laughs> The, 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 the government is broken, and, and I set out to try to figure out what it, would, what it would take to unstick this paralysis, and I concluded that the problem is not bad leadership, although I think there are some issues there. <clears throat> I also concluded that the problem is not mainly polarized politics. Indeed, I concluded that the polarization is more a symptom of the paralysis than a cause of the paralysis. When people feel powerless, the way they compete is by pointing fingers. It's your fault, it's your fault. And they make ever more extreme claims. And that's where I think most of this polarization has, has come from. And what I ended up concluding is that modern democracy actually has a structural flaw, has an institutional flaw, that we don't have a problem of a disagreement over policies. We probably do have disagreements over policies. But that isn't the main problem of our, our society. We have a flaw, which is that the way public law has evolved is it doesn't let our leaders make new choices. Decade after decade, the, all these well-meaning laws have piled up like sediment in the harbor until at this point, it's hard to get anywhere. And part of this is just the natural effect of an aging democracy. You know, laws get passed, and another decade, more laws get passed, and more, and pretty soon <clears throat> things pile up. But it's also uh, partially a problem of a deliberate philosophy. There's so much distrust, and it gets worse, the worse things work, 
There's so much distrust now that everyone on both sides believes that the only way law should work is to tell everyone else how to do everything. You know, we've got, uh, the Constitution was 10 pages long. The new Volcker rule uh, regulating proprietary trading by banks is 950 pages long. The regulations for the Affordable Care Act are seven feet high and rising. The statute itself was so long, 2,700 pages, that no one's ever found a member of Congress who actually read it. So is this, is this sort of how the, how the, how the rule of, 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 of law should work? And this problem is not only not sort of static, it's actually getting worse. It's a lot worse now than it was 20 years ago. It's going to be a lot worse five years from now. So we're going to have to do something about it. So let me tell a few stories just to put a, a human face on, on how this works. A couple of years ago, a tree fell on a creek in, town, in Franklin Township, New Jersey. Town father sent out a backhoe to pull it out. And then the lawyer, town lawyer, said, oh, no, this is a class C1 creek, whatever that means. And you have to get approval to pull any natural obstacle out of a creek. And the fallen tree was a natural obstacle. So what it, it took them 12 days and over $12,000 in legal fees to get approval to do what was completely obvious, pull the tree out of the creek and stop the flooding. <clears throat> Last month, that's just a story, a little story. Last month, the White House issued its five-year report on the 2009 stimulus plan. You'll recall that was $800 billion. That's like almost $3,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. $800 billion, and the main goal of that stimulus plan, you will recall, was to rebuild America's decrepit infrastructure, which has a D-plus rating by the civil engineers. We need to rebuild the bridges and dams and 100-year-old sewage pipes and all that sort of stuff. So I wanted to find out, well, how much actually of that $800 billion did get spent for that? Buried in the back of the report was this number. Barely 3% of the $800 billion went to rebuild transportation infrastructure. Well, how could that be? Well, the reason, as President Obama discovered, is there's no such thing as a shovel-ready project. Even the most obvious project, just, just fixing something that's broken, not putting power lines through virgin forests, just fixing something that's broken, requires years, literally years of approval. So the money basically got wasted. It went to shore up insolvent state budgets. It wasn't useless in the sense that at least somebody had a job. The money got spent by somebody. But it had no multiplier. It didn't make society better, better for the future. It is impossible to overestimate the density of bureaucracy today. At the beginning of, of, of my new book, The Rule of Nobody, I tell the story of a, of a bridge uh, in New Jersey uh, that had to get either replaced or raised in order to allow the new generation of post Panamax ships to get into Newark Harbor. Some longtime government employee actually had this brilliant idea that you didn't have to do anything to the bridge except raise the roadway. That even the 80-year-old bridge actually was structurally sound. You could save $4 billion and just raise the roadway within the existing arch of this bridge. It took them four years and, five, and a 5,000-page environmental review to get approval to raise the roadway of a bridge that didn't affect the foundations, didn't affect the right-of-way, didn't affect anything in the environment. 5,000 pages. And now someone's suing to stop it because they're claiming the review was inadequate. And you say, well, what were they doing during those four years? Well, uh, there was a requirement that they had to send notices to all the Native American tribes uh, who had ever been in the region, including as far away as Nebraska, the Shawnee tribe, see if they wanted to participate. That takes months. One of them did want to participate in the process. There was another legal requirement that they had to do a study of all the historic buildings within a two-mile radius of either end of the bridge, even though the project wasn't touching any buildings. It was using the same right-of-way, the same <laughs> foundation. But the law was there, and they had to do it. And that, of course, because it's government, requires them to go through a procurement process to find a, an expert to do the historic building survey. And then they go through that. It takes about a year for something that no one will ever read. So the, 
the law is kind of piled up with all these well-meaning things, but nobody has judgment, has room to say, well, gee, we don't need that. Let's just go ahead and approve it. And that's the reason why the $800 billion, to a great extent, was wasted. It's not just, though, how government works and getting approvals day to day. This legal accumulation affects everything. Budgets, 60% um, of revenue in the federal government now goes to three entitlement programs, very important programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, that don't even go to Congress for annual authorization. This just on automatic pilot. Everybody knows that all of these programs probably need to be adjusted to make them affordable. They're very important programs. But no one's even having the debate in Congress because it doesn't even come up for vote. It's not just the big things. Andrew Cuomo got elected governor. New York State had lots of budget problems like every other state. He discovered there was a juvenile detention facility upstate New York uh, that cost $50 million a year to operate, which had no juveniles in it and no prospect of any juveniles. He said, great, we're going to save $50 million. He made a big announcement, not so quick. Turns out there's a law amidst all these millions of words of law that get piled up that prohibited anybody from closing a public facility in New York State if it had any union employees without one year's notice. So the taxpayers of New York, that's 10,000 taxpayers each paying $5,000 a year in taxes, were spent, complete, were wasted, I'm sorry, to keep open a facility that had no usefulness to the public at all. Not just affecting government, laws are kind of mutual, are, are parallel. They not only affect government, but they also affect the people in, in society. So people tend to think, well, that's going to bind the government, or that's going to bind the industry. It actually binds both. Laws always bind everybody. So in America today, it's increasingly hard to do anything new. A kids who uh, opened a lemonade stand in rural America got shut down. They didn't have a vendor's license. They were raising money for pediatric cancer. Stories like that all around the country. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, found that if you wanted to open a small restaurant in New York, you had to get licenses from 11 different agencies. Imagine some person just trying to start a restaurant, figuring out which the agencies were, doing all the paperwork and such. America now, this is America, the United States of America now ranks 20th in the world in ease of starting a business. What's wrong with this picture? This is the land of the free. All this law that's piled up is preventing people from waking up in the morning and doing what made America great. And it's not just affecting daily business, it's also affecting our culture. This idea that there should be law has now kind of mutated into being telling us what's right and wrong. People no longer feel they have the freedom to act on their own values. You might get in trouble, someone might sue. You can't go on a field trip. You can't lead a field trip because there's liability reasons. No, no, it has to be a certified something. You've got to go on a school bus. You've got to, you know, all these different requirements. A couple of months ago in the District of Columbia, a longtime uh, Parks Department employee there had a heart attack while walking in front of a fire station. He was with his daughter. Uh, there, the firemen were standing there. They watched her, their first responders. <clears throat> she ran and said, help my father. And they said, oh, the rule is that we're supposed to call 911. And she said, ga he's gasping for breath. He needs to, you need to come help. No, I'm sorry, the rule is to call 911. It took 15 minutes for the ambulance to get there, and he died. You say, well, that's just terrible. How can people do that? Uh, a couple of years ago, a mother called the police in California, said her son had gone out for his meds, was depressed, had told her he was going to go commit suicide at a certain place, could just go wander into the ocean until he, and just tread water until he drowned. She called them. They went to this beach. And sure enough, there was somebody 100 yards offshore in the cold water in the, in the Pacific. And they watched. And passersby came by and said, well, why aren't you going to rescue this person? And they said, well, because of budget cuts, we haven't been recertified for land-based rescue. 
finally a woman came by and she dove in to try to save it, just to pass her by. She got there too late and she drug in the body. The next day, the fire chief who was there was asked, well, what would you have done if that was a child drowning? And he said, I know what I would have done if I was off duty, but if I was on duty, I would have to follow the rules. There is something happening to our culture that does not correlate with what any American believes, which is that in all these cases, nobody's taking responsibility, whether to pull the tree out of the creek, rebuild the president, rebuilding our fraying infrastructure, or saving the life of someone because the rules say you can't do it. So is this how the structure of democracy is supposed to support a free society? I don't think so. So I think there's something kind of fundamentally wrong here. President Clinton gave a speech last year in which he said, you know, the, the role of government is not to tell people what to do, but is to provide the conditions in which people are empowered to do what they think is right. Well, we've created a structure of government in which we're telling people what to do, and we're disempowering them, even the President of the United States. And, and you say, well, is this a better way for democracy to work? You know, at least everything's the same. Everybody has to follow the same rules and everything. Well, let's ask this. Who is responsible for the budget deficits? Exactly. Nobody. Who is responsible for the fact that we're not rebuilding the infrastructure? Nobody. Who's responsible for any of the failures we read about every day in the newspapers? And the answer to that is nobody. So we have truly achieved the rule of nobody. And there are two causes of this. The first is that we've lost the capacity for law to adapt to new circumstances. Congress enacts laws, state legislatures enact laws, and they set them loose towards infinity. They treat them as if they were the Ten Commandments because they went through the democratic process and they all got duly, duly, duly voted on by majority, et cetera, except now it's more like the Ten Million Commandments. And nobody goes back to see how they're working. This is not doctrines like laws against fraud or the constitutional protection of free speech. These are social programs, social management programs and regulatory programs. They always have unintended consequences. Every choice you make has unintended consequences. You have to bob and weave and adapt to make sure it doesn't, to make sure it works again, like riding a bicycle. You gotta lean here and there. We don't lean here and there in our society. These laws get passed, you know, and they're put on society. Um, uh, I think one law, one very virtuous law, special education laws passed in 1975. Before we had them, we needed this law because we locked up disabled kids in horrible places like Willowbrook. So we needed a law to make sure it didn't happen. But the law was enacted in a certain way, and it's evolved in a way that no one intended, so that today in America, Special education consumes more than 25% of the total K-12 budget. For the tiny fraction of the kids, probably about 7% who actually need it. More are in it because they stuff people in it, but, it's not, but they're not needed to be in it. <clears throat> There's almost nothing for gifted children and almost nothing for early education. Is that the right balance? Nobody's even asking the question. There is not one government program that isn't broken in this way. The question is whether it's broken 25% or 85%. But the solution is not what the Tea Party says, it's not to get rid of these programs. Most of these programs serve really important goals. The solution is to make them work. But nobody's going back to do that. Congress doesn't even see it as their job. Nancy Pelosi, the House Minority Leader, was on the Jon Stewart show, the Daily Show recently. He said, well, wouldn't it be a little better if some of these programs actually worked as intended? And, and she said, that's not our responsibility. We just passed the laws 
to which John Stewart said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was speaking to the House Minority Leader. Um, <laughs> So there's a significant problem where we pass laws and we never go back and, and, and fix them. That's one problem. The second problem is that we have no capacity, we've lost the capacity for humans to adapt in their daily choices. Just as legislatures and government doesn't adapt in its big legal choices, humans can adapt. And this is a uh, a philosophy of governing that one scholar uh, called rationalized completeness, where if you want to regulate anything, you should regulate it in as much detail as possible. So for example, in Arkansas, uh, well, I'm not sure about it, in Kansas, there's a thousand rules for nursing homes. Um, food shall be stored not less than 15 centimeters above the floor. Be served at not less than 115 degrees if it's hot food. Uh, there must be a minimum of so many square feet per person. There are 0 0.09 recreational workers per resident, except in these circumstances. Waste, tr uh, trash cans shall be in the West Room. Eggs shall be cooked. There's a, a thousand rules like this. Every, every state, every government is, is, is filled with these rules. And the, the problem with this is that people end up spending their whole day trying to comply with rules instead of actually doing things. And they can't pull the tree out of the creek or rebuild the bridge on time or do any of these because they're so busy, so they're so busy complying with the rules, and both sides subscribe to this theory. Liberals love the idea of telling business how to do things. They love the idea of the thousand rules. Give us more. Conservatives don't like government to do anything, but when it does it, they want it to be pursuant to very precise rules, as the, as the um, Nobel economist Friedrich Hayek uh, said, is government in all its actions should be bound by rules announced and fixed beforehand. This is part of the conservative mantra. And the idea, which is really understandable, is that you want law to be clear. That's the idea. Let's, let's make law clear. The problem is it's a myth. There is no set of words that ever makes law clear. Ambiguity is built into the nature of language. You can have thousands of pages and all it does is create more ambiguities, except it's far worse than the Constitution of 10 pages, because then when you have the argument, and there's always room for argument, you're arguing over the goal of the rule. When you've got thousands of pages, you're arguing over the parsing of language that's far divorced from the goal of the rule. So we have this whole society where lawyers spend their you know, lifetimes arguing over the meaning of language that has no connection to the actual goal of the regulation. Nobody's asking what's right and wrong. They're just asking, how should we interpret this language? You can't run a democracy that way. So what's the solution? First, we have to figure out a way to get rid of old law or fix it. We've got to be able to clean it out. Uh, sunset laws in general have not worked. The laws that, that must expire periodically and then be reenacted because it's too easy for legislatures to simply say, we hereby authorize an omnibus law, making all the other laws continue to exist again. So we either need to change our culture of governing so that legislatures actually, legislators are held accountable for how old law works, or I have a bill of responsibilities at the end of, that I propose to the Constitution. And the first one is a sunset amendment that provides that any law that has budgetary impact must expire, expires after 15 years, and cannot be reenacted until an independent commission has issued a public report. There's been a chance for the public and citizens to actually understand this, debate it, and figure out what to do with the old law. Our founders made a mistake. They were, they were the Madison and and all those guys were trying to please the anti-federalists by making it hard to pass new laws with checks and balances. And they didn't understand that it would be exponentially harder to get rid of an old law because as soon as the law is passed, it gets an army of special interest around it, 
That's why we can't get rid of New Deal subsidies and things like that, because there's a special interest there. So it just violates the laws of legislative physics ever to take anything away. So we need to change our structure to do that. Otherwise, this democracy is just a matter of finance. It's going to collapse in its own way. And the second is that we need to change our way of governing. We need to abandon this idea of clear law and actually go back to a law that, like the Constitution, that focuses on principles and goals. Um, I tell the, how Australia, a couple of decades ago, had problems with its nursing homes. It abandoned its 1,000 rules, replaced them with 31 general principles, have a home-like setting, respect the dignity of the residents, things like that. The experts scoffed at them. They said, these nursing home operators are going to get away with murder with these general roles and principles. They set out to study what happened. Within a year, all the nursing homes were twice as good. Why is that? And they've gotten better ever since. Because people went to work, instead of having their nose in a rule book, and regulators went to work, instead of saying, oh, you get a ticket because the wastebasket is outside the bathroom instead of inside the bathroom, or your paperwork is not in order, stuff like that. People actually went to work focusing on the answer to, is this the right thing to do? Is this what this resident needs? And there would still be disagreements, but now there would be disagreements about how to make things better, not whether you got a ticket for something that wasn't any good. The regulators didn't give up any authority. They could still close down a lousy nursing home, and the nursing home could, could complain and go to court and try to challenge it. But now everyone's arguing over what's right and wrong, which is what government's supposed to be about, it's supposed to make it better, not supposed to be a kind of a, 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 a software program of, of parsing language. So we need to fundamentally take these, there are now over two billion words of binding law and regulation in this country at all levels. So much law that nobody could know it. Nobody does know it. Nobody can comply. Even businesses giving months, months advance warning of an inspection can't comply. This, this quote, rule of law, isn't protecting anybody from arbitrary government. It's actually creating arbitrary government. You can close somebody down for anything because nobody can comply. So what's needed? Well, what's needed is this historic, probably not unlike the 1960s, but in a different way, an historic spring cleaning. There's a tried and true way of doing this. You appoint independent commissions area by area. You say, okay, how is special ed working? Should we, can we make it work better? Can we save money? Is there a better way of retrieving balance? Any two of us or three of us could get together on a weekend and come up with a system that's 10 times better than the current system. I guarantee you. And you come up with these commissions, and then the legislatures uh, adjust it, and they either approve it or not. This has happened throughout history. This is not the first time this has happened. In the 1950s, the Uniform Commercial Code was devised by a group of experts, approved by almost all the states, and it took a tangle of 50 different, or 48 then, different contract laws, and made them into one coherent contract code that was the foundation for the post-war economic boom in this country. Because everybody knew what the law said. And the law was general principles. It wasn't a lot of detail, it was protocols and principles. Uh, that's what Napoleon famously did with the Napoleonic Code early in the 19th century. That's now the foundation of law for half the developed world. That's what Justinian, Emperor Justinian, did in ancient times. And every time someone's done a recodification, it's like turning a muddy road into a paved highway. All of a sudden, people who woke up in the morning not knowing where they stand, not knowing, you know, it's too much work to go start a business, too much work to go volunteer, too much work to do anything because of the legal tangle. Now, instead of a legal jungle, they know where they stand, and you unleash all this human energy. And that's happened repeatedly through history. It's, America is at a point where, where it needs that. Is this feasible politically? Well, nothing is feasible politically today. As I said, they can barely raise the debt ceiling, you know, not do anything else. But what the political scientists say is that the more paralyzed it seems to be, the more certain it is we're going to get big change. These things never occur by small ball. 
They always occur in big gulps. What happens is pressure builds up for decades, and then like the stick-slip phenomenon of an earthquake, something happens, you don't know what it is, some street vendor in Tunisia catches himself on fire and then unleashes the Arab Spring. But the problem is, like the Arab Spring, it doesn't always end up so well, like the French Revolution. The American Revolution was actually an outlier. If you look at American history, more or less about every 30 or 40 years, we've had a period like this where things have snapped and we changed the way we did things. The 1960s, we woke up to racism, pollution, gender discrimination, lots of other things, and we changed the laws and our values. In the 1930s, we created the idea of social safety nets. Government would never even had the idea of doing that before. In the progressive era, 30 or 40 years before that, they finally got rid of laissez-faire after decades of rapacious corporations, you know, exploiting child labor and that sort of thing. The Civil War, finally, after decades of agitation by the abolitionists, we had to have a war over it. We changed our values there. So it's happens throughout history, we're overdue in this country. The current system is not sustainable. As rich as we are as a country, we cannot sustain half trillion to trillion dollar deficits. It's not a stable situation when, whatever the number is, 90% or something of Americans believe that government is terribly broken. So something is going to change. And so what we need and what we don't have is a philosophy of how to change it. We just have a bunch of reform groups. You know, the environmentalists are concerned about climate change and the deficit hawks are concerned about climate. They're taking each other's airtime. But where's our new philosophy? What are we going to change to? What do we believe in? And what I'm proposing in this book is that we need to take back the founding principle of our country, which is human responsibility. Never in the history of the universe has a rule ever accomplished anything. Rules are all about providing a framework for people to act. It's not about making things work properly and make people accomplish things. It's always a, a background, a backdrop, a platform for human action. We've taken out the human action part. It's never going to work. Democracy is not an automatic process. It's not a hands-free thing where we elect people and there's just mechanics to this giant legal machine. It doesn't work. We have to actually go back to a system where when we elect somebody and they appoint people, they have authority not to do what they want, whatever they want, but within the, the, the guidelines and principles of law, they have freedom to wake up in the morning and answer the question, what's the right thing to do? So we're going to have to make this choice. The system's going to change. And the question for all of us, and it's only going to come from citizens, it's not going to come from inside the government. Look at how they're working. They're lost in their own game. And that's true of all the other things I talked about, too, like the 1960s. It was all about citizens agitating. The citizens of this country are going to have to find a new narrative, a new goal for government, and I think it is restore human responsibility as the main operating force of our democracy, not this idea of automatic law. And when we come together behind something that looks like that, it will actually be not that hard to fix most of what's wrong with our society, because the goodwill is there, the economics are there, it's a great country, but we've got to take back control of it. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for some questions. Uh, and if you'll wait for the microphone to come to you, I'll give you. I enjoyed your talk. To me, it seems like uh, what's going on is a lack of respect for the human uh, faculty of the intellect. The intellect's proper function is to discern what's right and wrong. And we are being, that's been taken away from us in so many areas of life. And uh, it just reminds me of how uh, Madison said in the founding that our country probably wouldn't work without the basis of Christian principles and people who were trying to exercise them in a responsible way. And so to me, it seems that we need to go back to the founding and the Christian ideas that you know, undergird that. So what do you think of that? Well, I, I think completely right. So what, part of this book, um, I, I talk about the relationship of law and norms. Law does not exist independent of social norms. It's all about right and wrong. 
And if you have bad norms, like in Nazi Germany, it doesn't matter what the law says. You're going to get terrible things happen. The law can look just like the law in some good place. And when you take away human norms, you take away the, the Christian norms and other religious norms that people you know, have been brought up to believe in, th th then who are you? And how can you make anything work properly? If the teacher, one of our daughters is a teacher, if the teacher doesn't have authority to balance the needs of one child against the next, to decide who's misbehaving and who's not, without going into legal hearings, how can she possibly become a, you know, a role model of moral authority? I mean, all these values have to be applied. But if you take away people's authority, say, no, I have to call 911, or no, I haven't been recertified for land-based, why do we exist? Why not put robots in the, in, the, in the office? You're completely right. Human agency is everything. That's what a free country is supposed to be. Yes, question right here. Here comes the microphone. I'm not even sure I'm equipped to add, ask this question, but I'm going to try. Um, I don't know how you feel about big business owning our government or basically running the world at this point, but I tend to believe that there's that bent right there. And until that can get straightened out, until we put the bankers on trial uh, from Wall Street and other such things, and how are they going to become accountable? They're basically paying our paychecks and running the world, so until they become accountable, how can we? In order to be responsible, you have to be accountable. Um, holding a corporation accountable, like some big bank paying $13 billion in fines, that just hurts the shareholders. It hurts the pension funds that own the bank. You're absolutely right. So we need to develop for corporate misconduct, I believe, a doctrine of recklessness, where you don't have to show that you deliberately intended to cause a kajillion dollars in losses. You just have to show that you turned a blind eye. You knew there was the risk and you didn't do anything about it. And that's actually a well-established legal concept. That's why I agree with you. People in big companies have to be accountable. There's another problem with big companies, and it's hard to know what to do about this. But in a globalized world, the big get bigger. It's not just the rich get richer, but the big get bigger and the small get left behind. Main Street, I grew up in eastern Kentucky, little towns. You know, Main Street stores are all closed. Um, because of this, the incredible efficiency of Arkansas companies like Walmart, you know, there, or the search engines like Google. But the effect of that is lots of people are left behind. So I actually think we need an affirmative national policy. We need to fix what I was just talking about. But then we need an affirmative national policy that enables citizens to actually build and operate a second level economy and level of social services that's independent of all the big bureaucracies in both corporate and government that people can wake up in the morning and feel they own. Because there's nothing worse for a society than people feeling like you have nothing to do except watch television. And 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 big and the corporate, it's called corporatism, the corporatism of modern life combined with big government and all the rules, which is the ultimate centralization, prevents people from doing any of these things. You know, you can't go volunteer at a school even if you're a, you were a physicist because you're not certified to teach. Well, that's crazy. The physicist is going to know more about physics than, than, than most teachers. So we need to ease up on all that and let people you know, and find ways for people to become engaged and important while holding big guys accountable. Yes, sir, got a question over here. I'm wondering what you, th what you think about the principle of courage as we get started on this. If people need to take responsibility, then you need a fire chief who's willing to say, I don't care what the rules are, I'm instructing my men to go out and rescue the man out in the ocean. And, and if I get 99.9% .9 of us are going to applaud that, but if I get sued, so be it. Yeah. Well, there is a uh, lack of courage. There's a lack of courage even to engage the discussion we're having. You know, people don't want, people don't want to have this conversation. It seems too scary or big. Well. 
They can't avoid the conversation. The system's not sustainable. So ultimately, we need to elevate courage as the main value. There is one place where we're not getting any courage, though, that undermines courage, which is in the courtroom. And when, when we have a legal system that allows anybody to sue for anything, then what happens is not that if it happened to go to a jury, the jury would be wrong. But usually they're pretty sensible. But that nobody wants to go through the process and all the money and the years and, and the risk that the sheriff will come and take your home away, right? So the result is waves of defensiveness have swept across the country. Teachers are told they should never put an arm around a crying child. Well, what will happen if somebody accuses you that it was an unwanted touching? You know, my own law firm tells me that I can't give a good job reference because someone may sue if they don't get a good job reference or, or, or the like. Well, that's what I just ignore it. But, but um, no great act of courage there. But, but you have this defensive society where people don't act because they're told that they might get sued. You know, playgrounds, are, there's no, no, no place for kids to play. You know, there, there are no seesaws, you know, jungle gyms. So go, to, go to your playgrounds. Uh, you know, I, I challenge you to find anything interesting for something over the age of five, a kid over the age of five. Uh, other countries, meanwhile, there are playgrounds in New Zealand where they let the kids go catch, start fires in the play park, you know, and, and swing and drop into creeks and stuff. Well, our kids are going to be competing against those kids. Who's going to be more resourceful? So, yes, we need to reinstill courage, but that requires judges to take the courage of, at the beginning of every case, saying, if I allow this lawsuit to go forward, will it undermine the freedoms of everyone else in society? Judges aren't even asking that question. Let me ask you a question real quick. We were talking about briefly, what, what do you, what's your sort of, Overview, and I know we, this is not the topic of the, on higher education. What do you think higher education needs? Are you talking about reforming higher education? Yeah, yeah, higher education is a form of government bureaucracy, except for the Clinton School. <laughs> uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't pay for that, except, but, please, but please record it. Please, <laughs> Nat, please record that. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, big institutions always take a life of their own. I mean, that's just the history of it. So they need to get remade periodically. Um, Again, Bill Clinton said that. One of his, I think, inaugural says, you know, Thomas Jefferson said, periodically you have to remake government to refresh it. Well, that's true of all institutions. So um, the, if you combine the, all the different uh, kind of mortar and the bricks of you know, higher education, uh, professor tenure, so you can't ever get rid of anybody, is one. Um, the idea that, that, um, that people can go and just get an education even without any rigor whatsoever, no requirements. And, you know, most colleges don't have any requirements that you have to take math or science or even economics or that sort of thing. Well, I, I, a professor friend of mine did a study about how much people were learning in college a couple of years ago, Richard Aram at, at NYU, discovered they weren't learning anything. You know, they were having fun. But they actually weren't learning anything. So I, you know, I actually think we need to reinstill. I, I would say the most important thing is the idea of rigor uh, in, in in higher ed, and and begin to be a little more discriminating about who will profit from the rigor and who won't. I think we probably have too much higher ed at this point, and not enough practical training. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You got a question right here. Yes. The, yeah. He's coming to you with the microphone. We used to, in school, talk a lot about being good citizens. And I do feel that now the fact that we are not assuming responsibility enough goes hand in hand with the idea of being better citizens, accepting responsibility, mm -hmm. embracing responsibility, and the courage, as he said, to, to be good citizens and step up. Well, you're absolutely right. But in order to be a good citizen, you have to be able to take ownership. And the rules don't let you take ownership. So one of the things that we've been thinking about, we've been trying to figure out, well, how do you start a movement here? What, ha but what is it, you know, what would be the organizing structure under which Americans of different political views could come together behind the idea of restoring our authority to be citizens and to take back control? And, uh, and, and one of the ideas 
is to uh, embrace, uh, it's, it was originally a Catholic church doctrine called subsidiarity, where you push decisions down to the lowest level. So you have a much lighter touch of regulation on local schools. And you let local communities have, as, a, as charter school has do, much more authority on how they do things. And then you allow citizens to become more involved in the schools, as, as one example. And citizens can come in and lead field trips and help run, be teacher's assistants, do all sorts of things that now the rules don't allow you to do. And if you can do that, then all of a sudden you are a citizen. You are taking ownership for that institution and making it better. Citizenship shouldn't be a kind of a procedural act of casting a ballot. That's not citizenship, that's a, a tip maybe or something, but it's not, it doesn't really, citizenship is, is owning it and the bureaucracy is standing in the way. Yes, we have a question right here, right at the back. Allie here. Hi, I'm Allie. I am about to graduate this weekend, I think, from the Clinton School and the law school the next week. We hope. My mic and my back. Yeah, I hope. Let's hope that finals go well. My question yeah, you, is... Don't ask a controversial question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially since it's recorded. Uh, now, my question is, you've talked a lot about the legal system and, and how it affects all this. And I know when I took the ethics exam, I just thought, are you kidding me? This is ethical? It was like everything I thought a, a normal person should do was wrong. And, <laughs> and I had to learn that very quickly in law school. But what can we do as the next generation? I mean, is there something we can do to try to change that or even bring back the courage or affect a system change in any sense? Well, I, th I, I do think that there needs to be um, uh, uh, an organized movement in the same way that the, the progressives were organized and the civil rights movement was organized and the environmentalists were organized. Uh, I'm talking with some leaders of environmental groups now and some of the people uh, the deficit reduction groups about coming together behind a six-part platform that not all of them will agree on, but at least it puts everybody together under one umbrella and says we need to actually, our first obligation is to create a government that can actually change its priorities because we're never going to fix these things if the government's paralyzed. And, um, and so I do think there'll be an opportunity to join, hopefully, a larger group like that. But secondly, in your daily life, there are lots of studies that show this. Institutions that work, work because the people in them ignore the rules. Every successful school is run, literally studies, run by people who tell principals, who tell their teachers, forget the rules, do what you think is right. Studies of nursing homes that are successful in this country and other countries, exactly the same story. They're run by people who say, ignore the rules, do what you think is right for that person. And you can live your professional life that way. I know we have a lot more questions and people want to talk, but we also got to save time to sign this book and for people to talk to. Let's uh, give Philip a round of applause and thank him for being here. Thank you.